Good morning. morning. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Hopefully you have a uh, copy of the horizon or something that you can take some notes on and uh, an open Bible, an open heart. We've been at Mount Sinai for the last couple weeks, and it's been kind of a, a difficult, different kind of place. The Israelites, for the first time, are coming into contact with God in a unique way. They're hearing him speak, they're seeing his physical, visible manifestation on the planet, and it's terrifying them. So you see them wrestling with this reaction to God and this response, and you know, TJ mentioned that there's not a whole lot of fear of God anymore. You know, our society's kind of made man elevated and brought God down so that we can, it's easier for us to meet in the middle. So God's just kind of uh, fluffy and loving and nice. And, and because of all those things, you know, uh, th- th- it's, it's hard for us to wrap our head around that the Bible would actually expect people to fear God. But that's exactly what the Bible says and expects. We're going to start in verse 18. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, when you speak with us, we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. Verse 21, So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you and If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up the steps of the altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Father, we ask for your word to move in power. Lord, I pray that I may not misspeak or say anything that's not in accordance with your word or your desire for your people. Lord, I pray that you use me as a messenger and that the message be, be held and kept intact and pure and right. Lord, I pray that you move in power among us and that you use this word to shape us and to make us. Make us a different people, a people not just going through religious rituals, but a people that deeply desires and hungers for you. Not for your blessings or for all the things you represent, but just hungers for you. Lord, we confess we need you. Our life has no meaning, has no purpose, has no hope, has no joy, has no love without you. Help us and come near us, we pray. In Yeshua's name, amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm blind. You're about to learn four things. If you would jot some things down, that'd make it worse, my brother. If you would jot this down. I'm going to share with you from God's word two reasons for, for Israel's fear. 
two reasons why they were afraid, three aspects of the law, three aspects of the law. Number three, the role of a mediator. You'll see Moses as mediator today. We'll talk about the role of the mediator and the five purposes of the altar. Five purposes of the altar. The altar is a meeting place between God and man. We'll see that. Look first at the fear of the people. Look at verse 18. Let's break this down for you. It says, now all the people witnessed. They witnessed four things there. The Bible says they witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were one of the Israelites and I were physically there and I were experiencing this, I, were, I, was, I was seeing the lightning flashes and I could smell the smoke burning and I could, I could you know, hear the thunder from the skies and I could feel the earth shaking underneath me, I can imagine it's a terrifying event that they were going through. They were actually in God's presence. That verse goes on to say, And when the people saw it, they did two things. They trembled and stood afar off. Well, I guess so. I probably would too. So, let me share with you the two reasons why they were afraid. Write this down if you would, please. Number one, they feared the law itself. They feared the law itself. Exodus 19.8, they had just committed to do everything that the Lord said to them. So think about this. If they just made this commitment previously, Lord, whatever you tell us to do, that we will do. So then you fast forward, and they come into the presence of this, this ominous, powerful event from the creator of the universe, and they're thinking, oh, what have we done? <laughs> We just made a commitment to do everything that God said. And now we're in his presence and we're thinking, oh, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have said that. We should have said like people today in 2016. We're smarter today. We've learned so much. Today we would say, we will do mostly what God says. We'll do what's reasonable. We'll be reasonably good people. We'll do our best. We'll give it our best effort. For after all, nobody's perfect. That's today's washed down hedonistic version. So number one, they feared the law itself. They didn't understand that the law had both positive and negative components. They didn't understand that it involved not only external behaviors, but inward attitudes. All those are dealt with in the law. The second thing they feared is they feared God's threat of judgment. If you break the law, if you violate the law, there's always a price to be paid, and for that, that they, were, they were afraid. Here's what Charles Spurgeon the greatest preacher, in my opinion, in modern times, greatest preacher ever, uh, at least. Well, he's probably the greatest preacher since Paul. I don't know, but he's right up there. He's called the Prince of Preachers for a reason. This guy did more in a day than most modern preachers do in a month. He was just an incredible servant for the Lord. Here's what he said. The te this terrible grandeur may also have been intended to suggest to the people the condemning force of the law. Not with sweet sound of harp, nor with the song of angels was the law given, but with an awful voice from mid a terrible burning. By reason of man's sinfulness, the law worketh wrath. And to indicate this, it was made public with accompaniments of fear and death. The battalions of omnipotence marshaled upon the scene, the dread artillery of God, with awful salvos adding emphasis to every syllable. The tremendous scene at Sinai was also in some respects a prophecy, if not a rehearsal, of the day of judgment. Spurgeon's take on this passage. So he's saying it's giving them a, a, a glimpse of what was to come. Look at verse 19. Then they said to Moses, they're going to say four things to Moses. They start off by saying, number one, you speak with us. <laughs> we just want to deal with you, Moses. This, this thunderous God, he's a little terrifying. We don't know if he's in a bad mood or a good mood, and we definitely don't want to upset him. We think he's powerful and strong. So Moses, we'll just deal with you. You're just human. We'd much rather deal with just a human being. So they said, you speak with us. Number two, we will hear. Well, we know from reading the rest of Exodus, that's a lie. They don't hear, even though it's coming from Moses, right? They rebel at every turn. Number three, let not God speak with us. And number four, lest we die. So they said, don't let God talk to us. If God talks to us, it will surely die in his presence. Uh, let's 
talk just briefly about the role of a mediator so you understand this. A mediator is a go-between between two parties. He's, he's an instrument, he or she is an instrument that's used to communicate between two people, so or two parties. If these two parties can't get along, or if they have something important to discuss, or if the content of the mediation is critical or vital or important, then a mediator is brought in. And the mediator's role is to ensure that what the speaker is saying, the hearer or receiver actually gets, so that they understand what's being communicated. That's the role of a mediator. Also, the role of a mediator is to provide some distance between the two parties. Sometimes two parties can't get together. I mean, you put two parties in the same room and there'd be, you know, explosions going on. Anybody ever went through a divorce? Everybody's like, ugh. It would have been safer if I would have asked it. You ever know anybody gone through a divorce? <laughs> right? <laughs> but it can be it's explosive, right? It can be, you know, fires, you know, you know, explosions going off in the background. So sometimes a mediator's needed. You need somebody to come in that says, we'll bring these two parties together. I will communicate from one party to the other so that they understand it. And the mediator comes in to serve that purpose. Okay, so Moses is going to serve as a mediator. Now, they're asking him, Moses, will you mediate for us? You speak to us. We don't want to talk to God. If we talk to him, we'll die. Well, what they don't know is Moses has already been doing that. Moses has already been the mediator. He's been the mediator since the burning bush, right? Since God called him from the burning bush, probably on this same mountain, he's been mediating for the people of Israel. Now, the important thing for us is this is not just a history lesson from the Old Testament. This has important implications for us because Moses foreshadows or anticipates the mediator, capital M, that is to come, which is Yeshua, right? Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He will come and has come to be the mediator for us today. So Moses kind of gives us a glimpse of the great mediator to come. So Moses tells them that the, the, they should have a fear not of running away from God or being dismissed or, or, or trying to get away from him, but drawing near to God. There's two different types of fear. This type of fear that brings us near God, that humbles us and says, I, you know, I want to serve you. I want to make you happy. I want you to be pleased with my life. I want my life to reflect your glory. That type of fear is a healthy fear. The type of fear that Adam and Eve experienced in the garden when after they had sinned, when, when they heard God walking in the garden, some physical manifestation, some theophany, right, walking into the garden, when they, when they heard that coming, or when they, when they heard God coming, they ran and hid. That's the wrong kind of fear, right? Fear drives us in one of those two directions. Look at verse 20. It says, And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. Now, this idea of fear, he goes on to explain, you know, this God was doing this to test them. A test. So if you think about this for a second, if God was not there to punish or to, to, to rain down judgment, then, then most of their fear should have gone away. Right? God's primary role, even today, is not to punish. God is not the great punisher. Now, God does punish sin. God does punish rebellion. But his primary purpose is to call out a people, a people who will yield and humble their hearts and their lives and present themselves as a living sacrifice to him and live their daily lives for him, reflecting his glory on this planet. That's why you're here. You're here to reflect the glory of an almighty, omnipotent, powerful, precious God. That's why we exist. That's why the church exists. That's why the family exists. The family, like Pastor Todd had up here a little bit ago, you know, families represent in microcosm, in a, in a small setting, the very expression of God. That's, they, they, you should see in a biblical family, you know, a, a godly husband, a godly wife, and godly children, you should see the most full expression of God that you can see on this planet. You also should be able to look at the local church, the local family, the local assembly of believers. You should be able to look at them and see Christ. If you want to see what God looks like, you should be able to come here. 
You should be able to come here and worship and, and, and see people bow in, in, in humble obedience to the Lord. Some laughing because of joy. Some crying because of joy or because of pain. Because of confession and repentance. You should be, see people uh, uh, pleading for forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. You should see reconciliation happening. You should see admonishment and confrontation happening. Where people are saying, you know, you shouldn't have done that, Scott. You were out of line. And I say, you know what? You're right. I should have done that. You're right about this. Please forgive me. Right? You should see all those things happening in the local body. So you should see it in the family, you should see it in the church, and you should see it on this planet. The more we infect and invade this planet with the truth of the love of Jesus Christ, you should see it spreading. You see it spreading? Something's up, right? This is not the first time God tested them. Look at verse 20 again. In Exodus 15, 25, he tested them with the bitter waters of Marah. In Exodus 16, 4, he tested them and told them, just take one day's worth of manna at a time. You don't need to take more. I'm going to provide for you tomorrow. And remember what they did? You know, they, they gathered as much as they could because they were afraid that God wouldn't keep his word. They were afraid because they weren't faithful that God wouldn't be faithful. So they failed the test. So God has come to test them. It says, so that his fear may be with you, may be before you. Anybody got a different translation of how that reads? The second part of verse 20? Okay, anybody else have a different one? Fear of God may be with you, may be before you. Your Bible say anything different? May remain in you? Okay, so here's the idea of, of this fear. Now, obviously... If Scripture's saying, this fear needs to be with you, that's a good kind of fear. God would not want any kind of fear in your life that would bring in doubt, that would bring in anger, that would bring in angst or anxiety or worry. Those are not the types of fear that God would want in your life. So when he says that this fear may be before you, or may be with you, or may be around you, or may be in you, what's he talking about? He's talking about the type of fear that brings us into such a reverence for God, such a respect for the character and nature of God, that it causes love for Him and love for people to explode in our lives. That kind of fear, that kind of reverence that, that grows so high that, I, that my, my love for Him is growing and growing and growing and growing. And as a result, my love for people grows also. You can't have an increasing love for God and not have a love for people. You can't do that. Right? So that type of fear is a very positive fear. That fear should be rising in me. I want that, that fear in me. I want that reverence in me. That fear also protects me from violating his standards. You're going to see that here in a minute. If there is no fear, let, let, let's, let, let's put it this way. There are law enforcement people amongst us. We, if there were no laws, and the laws had no uh, uh, sentences with them. So if you could, you know, be arrested for murder, and if you were found guilty of murder, the, the, the penalty was you had to eat a chocolate ice cream cone. You're like, murder and I eat a chocolate ice cream cone? No one would be afraid to kill someone else. I mean, you would see, if that were the law, you would see the murder rate in, in, in Greenville County, go, you would see it skyrocket. I'm telling you, fear of punishment, it holds us back from doing things we shouldn't do. That kind of fear is good. You should fear authority. You should fear the holiness of God. But what does that fear do to you? If that fear pushes you away, that's a very unhealthy thing. It's not God's desire for you to be further away. It's God's desire for you to be closer to him. So the fear's got to bring us close, not push us away. Uh, let me give you three aspects of the law. Write these down if you would, please. If you can't write this fast, then uh, we'll have the video available so you can download the video. Three aspects of the law. It's to restrain us from sin. That's number one. That's what I was just talking about. So the law restrains us from sinning. If there were no law, sin would go crazy. Violations against people would go crazy. You wouldn't be able to go out in public. I mean, it would be that kind of thing. Your, your, your greatest fear would not be your retirement plan 
or you know, make sure you got enough money for vacation, or where you're going to go on your next cruise, or um, you know, your your uh, your spouse is having some health problems that you're concerned about. Those would not be your greatest fears if the law were not restraining people. Your greatest fear would be survival. Now that's foreign to us in the West. Now other places in the world they understand fearing survival. They get it to to know. You know, just how, can we make it through the day? Can I help my family make it through the day? And putting bars on your windshields and surveillance cameras everywhere and arming yourself to the teeth and, and just fear, gripped by fear. Prozac sales going through the ceiling. You know, people so eat up with fear that they're paralyzed and can't exist and can't breathe. Anxiety attacks and panic attacks. And, you know, you would see that go whew, across the planet if there were no law. So it's to restrain us from sin. Number two, it's to reveal our need for grace. Since I'm talking about the law today, I wore a... I wore a... A grace tie. A grace tie. Kind of balances it out. It so I'm talking about law, I wear a grace tie. You have a law tie when you talk Yeah. When you start seeing the law and all that the law entails, you begin to see immediately, there's no way I can do that. I can't keep that. I can't do all that the law implies. It's too much. It's too big. It's too massive. It's too detailed. It, it, it absorbs every area of my life and it never lets up. I mean, imagine that. I could be good for a little bit. You know, it's like the parents talking to the kid in the back seat saying, you know, if you be good for the next 20 minutes till we get to wherever, you know, you get whatever prize, right? I mean, I could be good for 20 minutes. But can you be good forever? Never a bad thought, never a bad word, never a bad attitude, never a bad behavior. The law shows us we desperately need grace, right? We have to have God's grace. If we have the law... And the law does not reveal grace. If this were not true, and it did not reveal grace, wow, would we be in trouble. I mean, the law would just be so, it'd be so heavy on us that it would be suffocating. Thank God that the law reveals our need for grace. And by the way, it's a grace that's freely available to us. A grace that you don't have to earn or be good enough or go out and, and do some kind of kind act to receive. It's a, it's, it's a type of a, a, a blessing from the Lord that you may, must only request God's grace, plea for God's grace, be acceptance and receiving of God's grace. It's just that simple. So it restrains us from sin. It reveals the need for grace. Thirdly, it instructs us in righteousness. So don't think that the law was just for people in the Old Testament. I've told you this from the beginning. The Old Testament is just as applicable to your life today as the New Testament is. There's no different. We call them two testaments. There's, they're really not. There's really one testament. And it runs from Genesis. <laughs> Generation. <laughs> it runs from Genesis to Revelation. Sweeps the entire canon of Scripture. That's really the Testament. Okay? But because of the way things have been separated over the last 400 years, we have two Testaments, a new and an old. And as such, a lot of people say, well, we're no longer under the law, but now we're under grace, and you have this whole big confusion about this word law. The whole word, the word itself, when it's translated in most New Testament Bibles, is mistranslated. It really means instruction, guidance. That's the true meaning of this word, instruction. So what it does is it instructs us. It helps us navigate life. It's a good thing to have the law. The law is good. It's beautiful. It's strong. It's powerful. It's clear. What would you do if you didn't know what God expected? It'd be terrible. If you just had to guess... Or imagine having a parent that, you know, every time you come home, you don't know what to expect because one day they're mad and in a bad mood because they had a bad day and so you get bad punishment just for breathing. And the next day they're happy and in a good mood and so you, you don't get in trouble that day. How would you like to have a God like that? That was capricious and changes with the wind and you don't know what he expects. The very fact that we know the law, that he tells us very clearly what he expects, y'all, that's a gift. It's a beautiful thing, so don't reject that. Verse 21 says, so the people stood 
afar off. Let me back up. Um, so he came to test them. This fear is before us. We see the three aspects of the law. Write down three uh, uh, texts for me. I skipped over. Write these down. You can go back and look them up later. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Romans 3.20. Which it says, through the law we are conscious of sin. So it's the law that makes our consciousness of sin uh, come to the surface. Uh, James chapter 2 verse 10 says, if you break one law, you break them all. Okay. 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6 says we have one mediator, or there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Right? So 1 Timothy clarifies for us in the future, or where we are today, it's future from Exodus times, there would come a mediator, capital M, Jesus Christ, who would be the perfect mediator uh, between us and God. So Lastly, it instructs us in righteousness. So it restrains us from sin, number one. Number two, it reveals our need for grace. The third aspect of the law is it instructs us in righteousness. Look at verse 21. So the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So you see the fear of the people. Now let's look at the purpose of the altar. Verse 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you, from heaven. So the first purpose of the altar is for us to see God. This right here represents our altar. Now Melinda made us a couple of these. And I was talking to somebody the other day about how we need to find a way to, to, to bring our altars in here. But we, we, these kneeling benches that she made are awesome. But this kind of serves the purpose for our altar. Now I've had people say, well Scott, isn't altar just something for the Old Testament? But it's, it's not. An, an altar is a meeting place. And it's a meeting place between God and man. So if you want to meet with God, you come to the altar. Now, do you have to go to the altar to meet with God? Of course not. Because ultimately your heart should be an altar, right? Your heart should be where you meet with God. But this helps us as physical beings to have a physical place that we can come and we can bow before God with other believers and pray. So the, we should be able to see God at the altar. He, his, his, his visage, his, his, his character, his nature, his beauty, his deliverance should all be more visible at the altar than anywhere else. So if you're ever desperate in your life, I would encourage you what they told the people of the Old Testament to do, run to the altar. <laughs> in the Old Testament, I, I explained this to you a couple weeks ago, but if you, if you could ever make it to the altar and grab the horns that were on the ends of the altar, you were safe. Even if your enemy wanted to kill you, they couldn't approach you. <laughs> it was a place of great safety and great protection. So I encourage us to have that same urgency today and get to the altar. Look at verse 23. So you should see God. Number two, it, it was to remove all idols. Remove idols. Verse, two says, or, uh, verse 23 says, You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. So the next thing the altar helps us do it comes so close to God that it causes us to have the desire to get all the junk out of our lives. I told you a couple weeks ago when we started the Ten Commandments to go home and get all the junk out of your, out of your, your house. You know, if you've got things that you idolize, things that people walk in, they say, oh, wow, and it and just draws their, their mystique and their awe and their wonder. And, and it, it gets to the point where it becomes bigger in your house than God. Now, people will say, oh, there's nothing in my house bigger than God. Well, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. You'd have to be honest with the Lord. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. Remember what the Holy Spirit did to a couple people that lied to him in the New Testament. Remember the Ananias and Sapphira? He just killed them over dead. So be careful about lying to the, the Holy Spirit. That's not a good thing to do. But if you have things in your, heart, in your house that you idolize or worship, if you've got any kind of uh, uh, altar worshiping some other god set up in your house, tear it down, get it out. More importantly, if you've got those altars constructed in your heart, tear them down, get them out. Nothing between you and God. So remove the idols, see God, remove the idols. Number three is to make sacrifices. Look at verse 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. Now, a couple things about these. Uh, write this down on your horizon. This burnt offering was not for sin. 
People mess this up all the time. They think that they were offering this animal to atone for sins of the people. Not true. It's not what a burnt offering was for. A burnt offering was to display full devotion to Yahweh. So right on your horizon, full devotion, because that's what the burnt offering did. Full devotion. You, that animal, this is kind of a crude way to put it, but the animal that they put on the altar and that they burned was an entire animal. Okay, the animal would be slain. Its blood would be uh, 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 dripped onto the altar, this little graphic. But then that entire animal would be burned until morning. Then the ashes would be collected. They would be taken to a place of sacred ground that they would have prayed over. And then the ashes would be buried there in the, in the sacred place. So it was that big of a deal to them. It, th- th- this animal was fully devoted, right? He was all in. His, his devotion to this act of sacrifice was complete. God asks us to be the same level of full devotion. Uh, it also represents the sweet aroma. The sweet aroma represents Christ's life, not Christ's death, but his life. That's the burnt offering. It's also in our place. Write down the word Corban, C-O-R-B-A-N, Corban. It comes from Mark seven eleven, And what Mark seven eleven, 11, where, where the Bible's talking about Corban, it's something that's devoted or dedicated to God. That's what the word Corban means. So think about your life for a second. Now, while your life, we don't want you to go burn yourself up, okay? But we do want full devotion. The Lord wants full devotion. So he wants you to be completely devoted to him. He wants you, your, your life to be something that's completely given over to him. No aspect of your life that he doesn't have access to. Look at the peace offerings. It says your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. Write down Leviticus 3, 1 to 17. Leviticus 3, 1 to 17. Burnt offerings were Leviticus 6, 8 to 13. Burnt offerings, Leviticus 6, 8 to 13. Peace offerings were also not for sin, but therefore, write this down if you would please, full appreciation displayed to God. So a peace offering was to lift up our appreciation for God. That's what it was for. So then he goes on to say, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record my name. Okay, this is the fourth purpose. So the, um, the, the first purpose of the altar is to see God. The second is to remove idols. The third is to make sacrifices. That's the burnt offering and the peace offering. The fourth is to proclaim God. Write down, proclaim God. In every place where you record my name, I will come to you and bless you. Our privilege at the altar is to proclaim the name of God, is to make his name known. Okay, so uh, in, in Traveler's Rest, if you were to go somewhere where people don't know the name or understand the character and the nature of God and understand it correctly, that's our responsibility. Now, it's every, every person's responsible for themselves to, to understand it for themselves, but we have a responsibility to make God's name known. Here's the last one. Verses 25 and 26 talks about purifying our worship, to purify worship. It says, And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. They would use their tools to create graven images on the stone. So the graven image would then become what they worshipped rather than God himself. In verse 26, the last verse says, Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness shall not be exposed on it. Now, the reason what that's talking about is a very practical thing. The priests wore long flowing robes. So as a matter of decency, they didn't want steps. The Lord commanded them, don't have steps. Because the moment you have steps, you're going to be walking up it, walking up it, walking up it, them, walking up them, that'd be better. I'll be ascending them. You would ascend them in a robe, and it's not very modest, okay? So God is telling them, don't give way to lust or any type of uh, uh, sexual event, because what he, he knew what was about to take place is in the next couple hundred years, once they established their, themselves in the land of Canaan, that they would give themselves over to all different types of, 
uh, sexual worship, all different kinds of, of weird things that they were doing at the temple, which carried all the way into Jesus' day. Still in Jesus' time, they were, they were still doing that. So it's to purify our worship. Uh, so here's what we learned. Two reasons for Israel's fear, the three aspects of the law, the role of the mediator, and the five purposes of the altar. There's a Puritan by the name of Thomas Watson. He said this, Though a Christian is not under the condemning power of the law, yet he is under the commanding power of the law. So you should be seeking to know and follow God's laws to the best of your ability. Write down Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. That passage just indicates that we're to present our bodies alive to God. So, I mean, metaphorically, well, I mean, if you were to have a, like a, a physical picture of this, I would be crawling and lying, laying. I would be putting, placing my body on this altar, right? I would be here on this altar giving myself alive to God. The most precious thing that I know that I can give to him is me, is my life, is the way I live it's my attitude, it's my words, it's my speech, it's how I impact other people. It's whether I lift them up or tear them down. It's whether I'm an encouragement or discouragement. It's whether I'm a teacher or someone who, who inserts confusion. It's whether I'm somebody of compassion or I'm hard-hearted, right? So I, I, I'm giving my life, I'm raising that up to God. Now Mark earlier talked about the offering. You ever been to a church that didn't have one? Not very many of them out there. Mark talked about how we, we give an offering of something that we love, right? We love money. We're pretty addicted to money, right? Money keeps us all tense and makes us, you know, crazy and makes some people want to steal and other people want to hoard. And Money does all kinds of crazy things to us or the love of it. Our life is the most precious thing we have. Your time is the most precious thing you have. So for you and I to offer sacrifices to the Lord that Exodus 20 uh, 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 presupposes or uh, indicates in advance, gives us kind of an advanced word picture of, we would be giving our full devotion and full appreciation to God. So think about those two things as I close. Devotion and appreciation. Because most people today are not very devoted to anything. They're not devoted to their families. They're not devoted to their job. Uh, they're not devoted to their church. I mean, they're not very devoted to anything, to be honest with you. We're just us as a people. God wants your full devotion. Fully sold out for him. Secondly, your full appreciation. How many times have you talked with people, even maybe even this morning? You talk to anybody this morning, don't, don't point. Don't point. But if you talk to anybody this morning that was negative, you know, biting, you know, that kind of. You're not going to like me saying this, but I love you. <laughs> this is the new kinder, gentler Scott. I'm going to be mad like I was two weeks ago. I got rebuked. I'm on a shorter leash, the kinder, gentler Scott. Watch the video. <laughs> it's unbiblical for you to be that way. You have so much, no matter what your situation, you have so much to thank the Lord for. You have so much to be grateful for. So much that God has given you. He's put breath in your lungs, allowed you just to breathe, allowed you to, 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 to speak, to, to navigate life, to meet people, to have families, to, to come and hear a clear exposition prayerfully of his word, to listen to amazing worship music directed at honoring the Father. I mean, he, he's given you all these things. You have no right to be negative. You are blessed. And you may say, Scott, you don't know my situation, and you're right, I don't. But I can tell you, if you're breathing, you're blessed. You reflect God's image from you. 
So God requests our full devotion and our full appreciation. Does he have that from you? Let's just have a moment of honesty, can we? Can you cut that camera? Herb? <laughs> People get shy when the camera's on. 